Now, if I have you build me a 22 long rifle, I want that thing stupid accurate. I want that thing to be a tack driver, one holders all day long. Can you make it happen? Now, that is a common question and a common statement that I get quite often when folks reach out to my shop. Can you make these things shoot accurate? And the truth is, a rifle is only 50% the battle. In fact, there's four reasons why that may not happen. One of them, the shooter's ability. Two, the gear and rifle's ability. Three, the ammo. And four, obviously, the weather conditions. All of these can be mitigated and obviously these can be improved upon, some better and easier than others. But in this video, we're gonna talk about accuracy of a 22 long rifle. What makes a 22 long rifle accurate? Part two, coming up. Facts or fallacy? We're gonna break those bits today based off my experience building these 22 long rifles. Lots to cover, you guys stay tuned. You'll like this one. Let's start off with optimum barrel length. Obviously there's a hell of a lot of controversy out there about which barrel length to get. Even Mr. Paul Harrell weighed in this factor recently on a video uh, showing how there's diminishing returns after a 20 inch barrel. So even a rifle like this, which is an 18 inch barrel versus a 24, which one should you go with? For a precision rimfire rifle or NRL 22 rifle, I've always recommended to my clients a 22 or 24 inch length, straight contour 1.20 or 1.25, primarily for weight balance and also from what I've seen testing these rifles downrange, I've personally found that the 22 to 24 inch rifles are more consistently accurate compared to rifles that are 20 inches or less, meaning that a box of ammo will shoot more consistently accurate in the sub threes versus a rifle that you have to basically find a lot of ammo that it likes. Uh, meaning that a 20 inch barrel or anything shorter than that tends to be a little bit more picky trying to find that ammo. So there's an absolute myth out there that folks are saying that a longer barrel like the 24 or 26 inch barrel, if you have a long barrel like that, you could actually manipulate your rifle before the bullet exits the actual muzzle, causing you to throw flyers. And that's absolutely incorrect. In fact, here's a chart explaining how fast these bullets actually travel down your barrel. So this chart is pulled from a ballistic simulation software called Quickload, and this is simulated with a 40 grain projectile 22 long rifle going at 1080 feet a second, so subsonic. On the X axis, that is the projectile travel down the barrel in inches, and on the Y axis, that is the time it takes to get there. So you can see that at 25 inches, which is a really long barrel, it only takes roughly 2.6 milliseconds to get and exit that barrel. So to put that in perspective, the average time for a human eye to blink is 150 milliseconds. Take into account the human reaction time as well, and me being half Asian, so I have above average reaction time. That means that that bullet is traveling 75 times faster than what it takes for you to actually blink the eyelid of your eyes. So unless you're superhuman, there is no way in hell that rifle's gonna move before that bullet exits the muzzle. It's just not gonna happen. Well, what about these longer barrels? Don't they start to slow down the bullet? The answer to that is actually yes. You can see here in the chart that around 11 inches, the propellant is actually completely burnt and the bullet is from there just traveling under momentum. So at a certain point, that bullet will actually start to slow down. That point of diminishing returns on velocity is around 20 inches. 22 it starts to slow it down and 24 to 26 obviously do slow it down, but not a lot like most people think. It's around 70 FPS. So from my experience, the optimum velocity that I try to achieve is around 1,080 feet a second. And this allows me to get consistent impacts out to 300 plus yards. Here's some footage of me shooting a CZ 457 that I rebarreled recently with a 24 inch barrel consistently shooting around 300 yards. 
And it's freaking hot out here, so this will be the last shots I'm gonna take. But at this distance, it's calling for 12.6. So this is where you'll probably see um, most NRL X match reach out to this far, maybe just a little bit further than this. But we'll try 12.6. And then let's see if this target cam's up and running here. All right, I think that was high. Try 12.5. Still high. 12.4. Okay, the 12.4 is the call there. That was a miss. Impact, first round. Impact. This is a 10 inch plate. It is just nailing it like it's nothing. We got one more. All right, so that was 10 for 10, 10 inch plate, 200 yards. So looks like it's all centered up there. I think uh, this thing is a shooter. So another common request that I get from folks is, can I thread my muzzle half by 28? And I always ask why, and the typical answer obviously is a suppressor or I want to run a tuner or something of that nature. Now, I'm always against turning down the barrel with a straight contour to a half by 28, simply because it's already a 1.2 inch contour, and turning it down to a half by 28 always, 9 out of 10 times, causes accuracy issues. So not only does it cause accuracy issues, aesthetically it also also looks funky as hell and there's not many muzzle devices out there that are going to match that contour in regards to accuracy the 22 long rifle is an extremely dirty cartridge all that lead soot carbon and lead fragments are going to collect inside your actual can and if you think about what a tuner is all that weight that's going to go inside your can is going to detune your rifle Unless you're willing to monitor the weight of your silencer as you shoot it, all of that debris is going to collect inside that can, the can's going to get heavier, and eventually it's going to detune the accuracy of your rifle. So in regards to accuracy, I am against running a can. If you think about it, the best in the nation that compete in NRL 22 or 22 PRS, they do not run any kind of silencers or muzzle brakes. Another food for thought, if you are a competitor, you pre-stage with the rifle pointed up. So all of that debris is going to be rushing down your bore, and good luck trying to get an accurate first shot. Now barrel tuners, since we're on the subject, do you recommend them? The answer to that one is yes and no. And I like to kind of brag that the rifles that I built typically don't need them. You know, like I mentioned, I test these rifles down range, and they don't leave my shop until they're shooting a .3 or better. Now, as far as a barrel tuner, can it help? Absolutely, it can. However, uh, I always tell and stress to my clients that you have to do the due diligence on finding the lot of ammo that's going to shoot well in that rifle. If you do not do this or lot test yourself, you're basically spinning your wheels, and a tuner is only going to throw you down a rabbit hole and chasing something that's just not going to be achievable. So, a barrel tuner, can it help? It absolutely can. It can tighten up groups depending if you are a travel competition shooter. So for instance, you lot test in your state 
you have to travel to the west coast and you find out that a lot of ammo that you have does not shoot as well as it was back in the east coast or wherever you live a barrel tuner can help you tune that ammo back into the accuracy that it once was so that's the benefit of a barrel tuner as far as its repeatability from what i could tell with these set screw style barrel tuners it is a set it and forget it style barrel tuner if you find an accuracy node or something a setting in that barrel tuner that works leave it alone tighten it down and leave it alone uh, there is no reason to be going back and forth trying to figure out different settings for different types of ammo uh, like i mentioned a barrel tuner is going to help you find and um, reduce the harmonics of the barrel it's going to find those resonant frequencies so just like a guitar string you tune it to a certain pitch or note it's the same kind of concept so on these barrel tuners if you're going to use one find something that seems to work be consistent set it and forget it but do know that sometimes those set screws will back out and if they back out well then you're kind of screwed you got to redo the whole process over again so it's got its caveats it's got its downsides and like i mentioned if you're considering one um, specifically with the rifles that i build it's, it's typically for a bench rest style build and I typically do not recommend the barrel tuners unless the client is 100% knowledgeable and knows that hey I have to go a lot test this ammo for this rifle before I start messing around with the barrel tuner. So it's very obvious that a quality rifle could factor in the potential accuracy of what you could produce downrange. Then depending on who builds your rifle, if there's quality craftsmanship, that factor could be factored out basically. Unfortunately, today's day and age and quality craftsmanship seems to be pretty much diminished. It's pretty much how fast can the person push the start button on a CNC machine. All right, folks, so this is going to be a little bit interesting. We're going to get into some science rocketry about the 22 long rifle, specifically the lead composition and the anatomy of the 22 long rifle. Now, I'm going to take my experience as a cast lead shooter and look inside what causes uh, certain lots of ammo to shoot accurate versus the other we're going to break down the 22 long rifle as far as bullet weight the powder charge and also the lead hardness which plays in a factor with everything that i talked about in part one with the bore diameter and barrel length so let's get into it i do want to state that i am not a licensed or professional metal urgist so I'm not going to state something I don't know. Um, some of the facts that I'm going to show here could be considered theoretical. However, we're going to try to back it up with actual factual data um, in regards to how the bullet um, works down the bore of your rifle. So we're going to talk about uh, bullet deformation. We're going to talk about obturation, optimum bore diameter, and basically how to find your bore diameter with the rifle without using an air gauge. So if we take a look at the design of the 22 long rifle projectile, this one I pulled with a kinetic bullet puller. And you can see that this bullet design is a healed style bullet. A healed bullet means that the base of the bullet itself will sit inside the case, which is usually around the same bore diameter. Um, and this one being a hollow base design, majority of the 22 long rifle, I think pretty much every single 22 long rifle is designed with a hollow base. What the hollow base allows it to do is put more weight front heavy to give this thing better aerodynamic stability. So the propellant being used in the 22 long rifle is a proprietary powder that's available only to the ammunition manufacturers. This isn't available to the general public. It's a very um, high filling powder, so it's bulky in design and very fast burning. So somewhat of a pistol powder. Folks that actually reload 22 long rifle use powders like tight group or something around that burn rate. Now, the powder in this is usually around one grain to one and a half grains. And it being a spherical powder, uh, this actually meters very well. And from my actual analysis and taking these uh, 22 long rifles apart, I found deviations only in about 0.1 or 0.2 of a grain. So lastly, what's stuffed inside the actual case of a 22 long rifle is a primer composition. And this is where the actual ammunition manufacturer varies the actual velocity. So the primer composition, depending on how much primer is in there or the substance that they use, the actual powder charge stays the same. However, the primer composition is what changes to give either higher or lower velocity. 
So another subject that gets brought up and in my opinion is, is considered a fallacy from my testing is basically case rim sorting. Now obviously there's tools out there like the 21st century case rim uh, sorting tool that supposedly is supposed to give you better accuracy if you sort the cases out by the case rim thickness. Now these cases are basically the 22 long rifle itself is head spaced off the case rim. So I can see where that kind of makes sense. Now, the variations in case thickness will pretty much vary how hard that primer hits or your firing pin hits the primer and thus giving you inadequate ignition shot for shot. However, from my testing, I've done some case rim uh, sorting myself. I found pretty much zero performance gain. And I think there's a lot more variables involved along with the bullet, its thickness, its hardness, as well as the primer composition and powder charge, the variations in that kind of overcome what case rim thickness does. So if we take a look at the outside diameter, the section of the bullet itself that actually rides inside the grooves of the barrel, um, the general rule of thumb for a cast lead projectile is to be one thousandths over the actual groove diameter. Uh, this is for obturation and 100% um, sealing of that actual projectile so gases do not escape. Now these things being coated with wax and all that, that's the lubricant that's going to ride in between the lead and the barrel as you see in the actual barrel itself. So the measurements I typically get on these uh, projectiles are 0.225. And then the measurement on the heel of the bullet the bore riding section is roughly around 0.208 or 209, depending on the bullet manufacturer. 208 is typically what I see for Elite 10X. So barrel manufacturers like Krieger, now this is a barrel stub that I cut off from a Krieger barrel in a 22 long rifle. This one, they have them labeled at a 0.217 bore diameter and a 0.222 groove. So you can see that they're following that general rule of thumb of one to two thousandths for the groove diameter. So like I mentioned, I've built quite a bit of 22 long rifle barrels and manufacturer rifles themselves. Now this is just a general idea of how many barrels I've created. Now these are not all 22 long rifles, some of them are center fire, but I keep these barrel stubs in case I need to make tooling or make a tuner or whatnot. But from my experience uh, sourcing barrels out there, I've tried barrels outside the United States like IBI or Luthwather barrels. And from my experience with, with those barrels is that those barrels run extremely tight on the bore and groove diameter. Uh, for instance, the Luthwather barrels, I've tried some of those and the groove diameter on those run around a 0.215 and the bore diameter around 0.211 or 210. In fact, those were actually too tight that my pilots on my reamers that I use, like the JGS reamer here, uh, were not able to fit. Uh, I have a plethora of pilots that will match certain grooves of barrels because not all barrels have the same bore diameter. Um, even you know, the same manufacturer like Krieger do vary a little bit on the bore diameter. So that's the reason why I primarily do not use uh, Luthwatha barrels or IBI barrels or other barrel manufacturers out there. Simple fact that I've seen a lot of deviation or they're just too tight on the bore and groove diameter causing more cold bore shift and primarily the rifles that I build are mostly for PRS competitors. Now how that plays an effect is that this bullet is going to swage down more than it needs to be and that's going to cause permanent deformation of the bullet. Uh, the bullet itself is going to then be relying on consistent powder charge and consistent ignition and all of the other factors involved, including the, the lubricant of the bore. Now, this is why cold bore shifts happen. The lubricant of the bore, if you allow it to cool down a little bit, starts to solidify, just like wax and just like the mineral oil style lubricants. Not only is there wax in the bore, there's also carbon. And as you know, carbon is a very hard material. So as the lubricant itself solidifies, what ends up happening uh, is it starts creating more of a high spot in the barrel, which then again causes this lead bullet uh, to once again deform more. And this is the reason why we start seeing cold bore shifts. Not only does the tighter bore play an effect on the permanent deformation of the bullet, it also plays an effect in the velocity. The more bearing surface there is around this lead bullet projectile, the slower that bullet's going to go. 
So having a properly sized bore and groove diameter matched around the projectile is obviously crucial. Um, having a little bit of give around the groove diameter is going to allow the lubricant and debris to go somewhere without it permanently deforming the bullet, allowing that projectile to make its way down its path um, shot for shot as uniform as possible. So having a tight bore and a tight groove diameter barrel is not necessarily a negative thing. It really depends on the shooting discipline you're involved in. In fact, a lot of bench rest shooters out here do prefer the lower groove count as well as a tighter bore for the simple fact that they have ability to shoot sliders prior for shooting for score. The tighter bore and groove diameter does offer better sealing power. And from my experience, I do see that these tighter bore barrels um, with a correct a lot that's uh, matched to that barrel they start to shoot pretty damn accurate we're talking you know consistent point ones and stuff but typically that takes around five to ten fouling shots and then automatically going for score all right so we are going to test to see what kind of diameter we have on the bullet now i do have a little magnetic uh, ball here which is going to sit pretty much right on the bottom of the heel of the bullet here as so so here's a uh, barrel i just chambered up We'll be very careful on how we do this. Okay, so once it gets in there, you should be able to push it all the way through. Okay. All right, so now we have our swaged bullet down the bore, and we'll be able to take some measurements on that. So according to this micrometer here, we have a groove diameter of a 0.221 in um, 510 thou. So uh, that is a little bit tight on this barrel. And then the bore diameter is roughly 219 thou measuring from groove to groove here with these calipers. So this is just a rough estimate. Um, ideally, you want to use a micrometer with the points. However, this is a soft piece of metal. So getting an accurate reading will be pretty difficult. So 0.219 is a little bit too large of a diameter in my opinion. So hopefully that explanation on bore and groove diameter makes sense and why we have cold bore shift. If you guys have any questions, obviously you can comment below. But let's switch gears and talk about the ammunition. Why is it that when you buy a certain ammunition brand, one lot of ammo will shoot better in your rifle versus the other lot which is still labeled the same style of ammunition well this is what the ammunition manufacturers do for us because we are unable to basically reload 22 long rifle efficiently yeah you can reload 22 but it's it's just really cumbersome it's not worth it so this allows us the consumer to purchase ammunition of the lot number and lot test for ourselves to find what our rifle really likes like i mentioned the ammunition manufacturer will vary the primer composition thus varying the velocity and obviously you know when anything's changed like primer powder or even a projectile all of those play an effect in harmonics so ely does list their velocity on each lot right here this one's labeled at 1059 this one's labeled at 1061 these ammunition themselves are lot tested from the manufacturer with 24 or 26 inch barrels. So that's why these Ely 10X tend to run pretty hot with barrels that are around a 20 or 21 inch or 22. You'll see velocities around 1100 feet a second. So even calling Ely themselves and asking why the hell aren't you guys offering ammunition that is a little bit slower around the 1080 for us barrels that are shooting 22 inch they will ask, why are you guys shooting a 22 inch barrel? So let's dive into what they're talking about and I'll do my best to explain what Obturation does and why these longer barrels do perform better as far as accuracy, lot for lot. So let's take a look at a chart of some of these bullets that I pulled apart. These are the Elite 10X bullets. I measured a couple lots that are, one of them being a lot that I know doesn't shoot as well um, with the Elite 10X versus the other lot. I've also taken apart some Lapua and Midas Plus bullets there. And again, my other lot of ammo that shoots very well at a majority of the guns that I build and see why this lot of ammo of Ely 10X shoots better than this lot.
A tool that I'm going to use for this testing is from Lee Precision, and this is a lead hardness testing kit. This one allows you to put a dimple inside a bullet and actually test and measure what your Brunel hardness roughly is. This allows you to figure out what type of lead alloy you have, and as well as match the working pressures of that lead alloy. That way you don't permanently deform the bullet. So how this tool works is very unique. You put a flat spot on the bullet and then you run it up on the Lee Hardness die itself. It has a spring-loaded detent ball in which you hold for about 20 seconds on the downstroke position and it'll put an indentation for you to read. With the provided microscope, you could then shine a light and look at the indentation and get a reference number in which you could reference off the chart. This chart will then tell you exactly the BHN value of that lead composition, thus giving you your working pressures of that lead alloy. So referencing quick load and simulating a subsonic 22 long rifle, the working pressure for a 22 long rifle is around 8,824 PSI with a 22 inch barrel. So with that estimation, the best BHN value that best matches the working pressure is going to be around 6.8 BHN. The value for the indentation is 85 thousandths with the working pressure of 8,831. So using the Lee Hardness Tester as a tool to verify our projectile's BHN value, the bigger the indentation, the softer the lead alloy is. And according to the Lee Hardness Tester, we are working with a BHN value on the majority of the subsonic bullets around a 6.1 to 6.3 BHN. The working value of that is a little bit lower than what the simulated 22 long rifle is according to Quick Load. So I randomly pulled five cartridges on a couple boxes of Ely 10X, one of the lot numbers being uh, a very good lot that shoots very well out of majority of the rifles, the other one not so well. I've also pulled some of Lapua Center X as well as Federal Auto Match as a comparison. And again, the bigger the indentation, the softer the lead. So the Lapua Center X actually has the softest lead composition out of all of these types of ammo. So the Federal Auto Match is obviously the harder lead alloy compared to this chart. They're probably adding more tin or antimony to bring that BHN value higher in order to get the working pressures higher in order for it to work in semi-auto as well as supersonic velocities around 1200 feet a second. So looking at the Ely lot number, the orange line is the Ely 10X that I've had issues with accuracy throwing flyers. The pink is the Ely lot number of 10X that I've had really good luck with in a majority of rifles. And you could definitely see that the Ely uh, 10X with a bad lot had more deviation on BHN over the other one. So taking a bullet weight test, again these are five random samples that I pulled. The big elephant in the room is that Lapua Center X. Now that lot of ammo from Lapua has always thrown flyers here and there and I've always wondered why. And like I said, these being five random bullets, uh, one of those projectiles being 1.6 grains less than the others, that kind of shows why that lot of ammo is having issues. The other ones seem to be within 0.2 of a grain. Um, again, these lead projectiles are swaged from a lead wire. So the quality control, you could definitely tell, is different lot for lot. So lastly, we're going to take a look at the powder charge. And no surprise, the powder charge being spherical powder is pretty uniform. Majority of the subsonic cartridges are around 1.1 uh, grains. The supersonic bullet is around 1.2 to 1.3 of that type of powder. So nothing surprising here in the powder charge. So let's jump back to the Ely 10X. Now that's going to be the orange and pink line. The pink line I've had really good luck with in accuracy. The orange one, not so much. And you can see that the pink one has a smaller indentation, which is showing that it has a harder BHN value. This one is around 6.2 BHN, and then the orange one is around a 5.9. So the one in pink has a higher working pressure that best matches that ammunition powder charge and all that versus the other one. And now how this correlates with barrel length, I'll try to explain here. So this can be considered theoretical and I don't really have the knowledge to thoroughly explain why this happens. However, I can share the downrange results. Like I mentioned, the 22 to 24 inch barrels tend to shoot more accurate downrange. And in my opinion and in my theory, I think what's happening is that the bullet, once it's permanently deformed from the pressures of that, of that projectile matching that BHN, that extra length of barrel is allowing that bullet to uh, 
basically come back to original form. That is called obturation. Obturation is the sealing power of that projectile and its temporary elasticity to form back into its original shape. So that extra length of barrel is allowing that bullet to swage back into a more uniform shape. So shot for shot, that bullet itself, the projectiles leaving that barrel are more uniform than others. Again, this is my theory, um, but from my experience, the 22 to 24 inch barrels, uh, they tend to shoot better and accurate lot for lot. So tying in all the analysis here that we that we spoke about the BHN value the working pressures um, the barrel lengths the bore diameter and the groove diameter all of those coincide with how these rifles perform downrange the tighter barrels obviously cause more pressures cause more deformation of the bullet um, the BHN value is a huge crucial point that I don't see anybody talking about on online and having a very soft alloy can actually cause more deformation of the bullet and uh, poor obturation. So let me know what you guys think. This is something that uh, I wanna open it, uh, the books up to you guys. Uh, comment below. I hope this wasn't too much information. That's way over uh, you know your heads. But if you guys have any questions, comment below and I'll do my best to answer them. And I really hope you guys enjoyed this uh, two-part series. If you made it this far, I wanna say thank you. Throw a like and subscribe if you don't mind. And as always, y'all stay safe out there. I'll catch you in the next video. Thanks for watching.